church in the New Testament is the church in a neighborhood. The church in the New Testament is the presence of God. It is the people of God united together who see themselves as being Christ's body, his hand, and his feet in that neighborhood, in that community. For the church is to be the replacement of Jesus on earth. We're his body. We're his replacement in the community. Let's look back now at this is illustration in this passage here. So the thought here that Jesus 1900 years ago was God clothed in flesh on earth and the word was made flesh. Today, the church is to be the inhabitation of God. It is where God lives in the community. We are the stone built together in the community to form a temple, a habitation for God. And we are to be his hand, his feet, in that neighborhood and in that community to do his will in that neighborhood. There's a verse that just absolutely precious to me. It says, as he was, so should we be in the world. We the church is to be Christ present in that community. So with that in mind, let's go for just a minute here. Let's go up to Jerusalem. Let's look at Jesus' behavior as we, as we do that. Let's go back. What I'm trying to get you to do now is to go back to the New Testament and, and pick up Jesus' behavior. See, Jesus was God, and since he was God, his plans and his ideas are still valid. And, and, and we can follow his principles. You know, and we can follow him. Sometimes I hear great outstanding preachers there say, let's go back to the religion of our founding father. I said, I don't want to go back there. I'm just saying. Your <laughs> founding father's religion wasn't good enough. We need to go back to the New Testament and see how, as he was, so should we be in the world. That's what they're doing tonight. See, we're not looking at some place in our history and we're saying sometime in our history, see what is really happening to us? What is really happening? And this was so real to me in Africa. It became absolutely real when I was in South Africa. We have, there are four basic world theologies. And the first and most dominant Imperialistic theology is white theology. And white theology sets itself up in judgment over all of other theologies. And every time oppressed people try to get God on their side, this imperialistic theology defines that. And define it. And they say this is liberation theology. And so it's bad. When black people are oppressed and say, we want God on our side, they'll say, that's black theology. But nobody has defined this white imperialistic theology that in the name of God have colonized the world. Amen. We got to know that white theology is not happening. <laughs> black theology is not happening because it's a reaction. Liberation theology is not dynamic enough. It's a reaction. What we need to do is go back to the theology of God. The theology of God. Going back to our founding fathers, we're going back to the Word of God. We're going back to the Bible. And putting God on our side in the Bible. So let's, let's, look, let's look at Jesus here. Jesus go up to Jerusalem. When he go to Jerusalem, it says he a pool where there were a lot of sick people. Poor, blind. Jesus, you know, at that feast, basically what they were doing there was feasting. You understand that was feast. Instead of Jesus going to where people was feasting, 
he went to the pole. You know, our identity as the people of God is our attitude toward the poor. To think that you can be Christian, to think that you can follow Jesus and be indifferent to the poor is not to understand what it means to follow Jesus. The words tonight, the first words that come out of Jesus' mouth in terms of his ministry, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, but he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. First thing. James says, true religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, the visit of the fatherless and the widow, and the people on the and spotted in the world. The saddest story that Jesus tells in the New Testament is the story about a man's attitude toward the poor. That's the saddest story in the New Testament. The rich man in Lazarus. Now I know whenever I say that, whenever I say it, anytime I say it, people always say to me, you're the reverse racist. <laughs> they always say to me, what about the rich? Well, I want you to know God loves the rich. God loves the rich. But in the New Testament, all of those rich people who came to him had to respond to the poor first. They authenticated themselves by their attitude toward the poor. The rich young ruler came. Jesus told them what to do about the poor. He went away saying, Zacchaeus came. Zacchaeus went away joyful. Because Zacchaeus said, I got the right attitude toward the poor. And Jesus says to him, today, salvation has come to your house because of your attitude toward the poor. That's how we are thinking this. We are not talking about tokenism. We are not talking about charity. We are talking about our identity as the people of God. That's our very identity. God do not call us to be poor. He called us to be with the poor. He told us to serve the poor. He told us to open our hand and allow him to bless to us. He's the source. He's the source. He's our source in, in life. Well, let me conclude this. Let me conclude my talk. What are the seven ingredients that go into it? holistic Christian community development. What are the seven things that we got to know about Christian community development for it to be holistic? Now, I'm talking about the seven ingredients that go into the kind of association that we are talking about here. We are talking about a whole church taking a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. I'm going to tell you about what go into that wholeness. I'm going to tell you now about the seven pieces. And those seven pieces must be held together in a unit. And all seven of these must be a part of holism. And they must be working together at the same time in order for it to be holistic. Otherwise, it's going to degenerate down to charity. And you're going to be asking these questions. Can you help people and can you get them saved at the same time? You're going to be asking all of these foolish questions. you got to understand the whole gospel. What we're going to look at is those seven pieces that go in there. And they must be held together equally as we go out there. What is the first thing you understand? First thing we must understand is the church itself. Without you understanding that God is primarily doing his work and his will through his church. So we have to understand the church. We gotta understand that church is his body. And that we are members of that body. And he's working through us, his people, united together, and that one person don't represent. Lady Church. There's not an illustration in the Bible where that you become a, a representative, individualistic of Jesus. 
The New Testament law is that you are a witness that you've been with Jesus. See, we are witness individually. But together, collectively, we let our light shine that the world might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So we must understand the church as the body of Christ. That's important that we understand that. Number two. Back to number one. <laughs> you have to understand also that the church is in the world, but the church has an identity of its own separate from the world, and the church is a witness to the world. And the church is not necessarily, necessarily saving the world. That is sort of God's work. Doing the saving. We have to be a good witness to the world and let Christ himself add to the body those who must be saved. The church must be built in reality by Jesus himself and not by us. We become an agent through which he works through his spirit and through his word to form the church. To form the church. So the church is a body of Christ. He's good in his church. He's good in his church. That's important. That's important. This homogeneous stuff is not good at all. Church growth. That's not our business to grow churches. That's God's business. The New Testament church, he added to the Bible. There are things that we must do in the body. We must understand our place in the body. And we must get in those places in the body where God moves up and then watch God add to his church. That's absolutely important. Number two, we got to understand the gospel. The gospel. The evangelical community has messed the gospel up. <laughs> they have made it primarily a a proclamation. They have made it as something you can say they can be mean and evil and still talk about the gospel. The gospel is the visible demonstration of God's love. The gospel is the way God makes his love visible to mankind. We see God's love visible at the cross. Greater love than no one than this and woman ever life was friend. We see the love of God at the cross. And when you and I are talking about preaching the gospel, we're talking about going to the extreme. We're talking about what Captain Dillon was talking about. We are doing what is necessary to let people know that we love them. So the gospel is both a proclamation and its manifestation. It's, it's about our loving presence that we become the loving presence of God in the community. So we have to understand the gospel. We have to understand the purpose of the gospel. That, that's what I can understand in South Africa. This, the purpose of the gospel is to reconcile alienated man to a holy God and to do that in one body. And in that body there is either Jew or Gentile, born or free, black or white, but one in Jesus Christ. See, the church that we have today <laughs> is not a reflection at all of what God intended his witness in the Old Testament to be, not his witness in the New Testament. The Old Testament <coughs> nation of Israel was never to be a nation based upon their nose and the color of their skin. The call of that Assyrian, Abraham, he called it into a land and he gave them a sign of what it meant to be a Jew, and that was not an outward sign, that was an under the cover sign of circumcision. <laughs> the whole idea of the Jewish nation was to bring people from every nation. Abraham Paul was a witness to all the families of the earth. Amen. God had called that nation, and it made provision for that nation to be a multi-hostile nation on earth to reflect his love in the world. And I think why the Jewish people failed and became a big institution, God prevailed at Pentecost. Because the Bible says that at Pentecost, proselytes, proselytes from every nation under heaven in that first church at Pentecost, representing every nation on the hill. 
that love him more than they love that culture, that background. And the world would know he was Christian. God is not a racist bigot. What we've done is set God into our bigotry and is trying to do religion without getting rid of our bigotry. Yeah. And we have created a theology to justify that, and we call it Holy Jesus. <laughs> and so we are growing churches that are not effective. We are growing churches that are trying to find out how to reach these multiple of people who are coming into the city of these different races. And we are steady trying to find out how to do that. All you got to do is go back to the New Testament. Yeah. Go back to the New Testament. Go back to the New Testament. The purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel is to reconcile, alienate man to a holy God and do that in one body. Number, what was the next number? <laughs> <laughs> we must understand number three. We must understand. We must understand God's call upon our life. That's important. Number three, we must understand God's call upon our life. And we must understand God's call is re in relationship to his own sovereign grace. And it's God's call is God himself places us in his body in the place where he wants us. And it's our responsibility to stick when he put us there. Stick in the body. Find that place where God has for you in the body. God had a call on your life. He wants you to find that place. And you ought to get the enthusiasm and the joy of being in that place where God wants you. What's in the Bible? Paul. Number four. We must understand what we are called to do. We are called to do evangelism. We are called to reproduce after our kind. We are called to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. We are called to do that. That's what we're called to. Everything that we're doing. I'm back to what Captain said. Everything that we're doing. Now we are feeding people because they're hungry. We're giving people a place to live because they don't have any place to live. But it's our hope and our prayer that everything that we're doing, we're doing it that those people might see Jesus in the way we are going about doing it, that they might ask that question of the reason of our hope. Of the reason of our hope. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? Then we tell them we are doing it because we love Jesus. Because we love Jesus. We are doing it because he loved us. We love you. Number five. We must understand our social responsibility. That's absolutely important. We've got to understand our social responsibility. You can't do Christianity or holistic development without understanding the political responsibility. I meet these Christians who, who think that if you do anything politically, somehow or another you are out of God's realm. You see, The homeless is an absolute travesty for our country. The homeless, think of now the homeless people and think of how much it would take the feet and the power of the homeless. And you think of how much the greed and ripped off of the state of the loan is going to The billion they said it might run $160 billion that these greedy people ripped off. Those institutions were set up primarily to provide housing for people in this country. Think of her. And think of the last eight years how these political greedy people have ripped off her. It's a, with enough money ripped off to provide housing for all the homeless in this country. We at the ghetto level, and what Maryland is doing, and what we're doing talking about housing, we must, we 
much the poor. What we're doing must refocus our nation. We must love our nation. And we must give it refocus. Refocus. This nation was to be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. This nation was to be a nation that was concerned a government by the people for the people. We are moving towards becoming a government by the greedy for the greedy <laughs> in our society. To become a politician, to become a congressman, you got to have a million dollars or more to be a representative from your district. But we got to create people from our movement they come from our community based upon what we are doing. They got to be the one to come out and it's got to become a people movement. People are going to elect those people. Got to be people like Turner in this community. Who's a representative from this community. Who is elected by these people and is working for the good interests of these people in our society. That's what we got to get. We got to get people again who absolutely represent the people within the community. <clears throat> number five, number six, we must understand economic development. To me, economic development is job making. We got to think of helping people to work. We got to think of abolishing, getting rid of the welfare system because that system is putting the final touch on ghetto people in the ghetto. That system is destroying our people. We have got to work in the community. Take responsibility. I don't have a church. I'm not totally satisfied with my church. But I want you to know, there's one thing about the little church that I go to. When people come to my little church there and come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, they don't stay on welfare. We get those people out of welfare and they have the dignity of working. That's what we got to do. We got to affirm people's dignity by helping them to do creative work. We need to believe that people can make a contribution to the community and to the society by creative work. Jesus says, teach them to work with their own hands so they can be able to give to other people's needs. The joy of being able to give and to share. And most people would want to do that until they are retarded. Many of these welfare programs just retard people in the community. So we got to talk about how we help people. How do we get them job ready? How do we start daycare centers? How do we start schools? How do we start? We start talking about training people uh, from the time they are three years old with the idea of them becoming productive in society. I kept saying this when I was in Africa. I spoke to all the groups, large crowds of people. And I tried to illustrate to them, especially those large whites the others I would speak to, I would say, 14% of you folks is completely dominating the life of 80% of the population. Not giving them any voice whatsoever in the government. You don't believe in inherited dignity of me. Then I illustrated. I illustrated by my state, California. I said California is probably one of the poor states in terms of natural resources at the offset in any state in the United States. Desert, mountain. Desert. Not much water. Well, it is the scuttle of gold. <laughs> but what happened there, though, the leaders of that nation came up with a universal system where everywhere there was a population of people, they put a university within 50 miles. Then they pushed that down and they put a community college within every 10 miles in Southern in California, where there's a population of people, there is a community college. And they made that 
free. Ninety dollars a semester to go there. That mode we place is support 26, 27 million people because they believe in inherited dignity and we are getting all these people from El Salvador, Mexico, and all these people. And California need them. Need them. Need them. Because they build a foundation that was based on dignity. They try to train their people to do decent work in the community. That's what we're trying to do in our neighborhood. We're starting the school in January for welfare mothers because we know and most welfare people don't know that the work that the Welfare Reform Act is triggered in 1991. I have worked on the bill. I have worked with the people on the bill. And people don't know that in 1991, that everybody that have a child three years old and older will have to apply to work. It's going to be a tragic situation. And we need now in our communities and all of us here need to be thinking about what kind of a skills <laughs> training. Most of us here now have computers and things. We need to bring our ducks in and get those mothers and take those people and teach them English and Spanish and believe they can make a contribution. Believe they can make a contribution. Believe that they can enrich our lives. You don't look at people as being a liability. You look at people as being people who can make a contribution to our lives. Those people are going to benefit all of us and our lives and we made richer by their life. Number seven, the last. We must believe in justice. We must understand justice. And justice is not a mistake. That was a mistake. That's a mistake we're making as black folks. We thought that was a civil rights movement, and somewhere we got justice, and now we're losing. And now our energy now has been, been going because we're losing justice. So we don't understand justice. Justice is not status. Justice is not something that you get. Justice is eternal vigilance. Justice has been alert. alert. Justice is working. Sin. Justice is striving. Justice is always active. So we got to understand justice. And we got to forever be working for justice for all of our people within our, within our society. What is justice in, in the end? Justice is understanding who owns what. Justice is understanding who owns the earth. Earth is the law and the fullness are all. It's our responsibility to be working together with God so this earth can continue to yield its resources for the highest good of total humanity. We are working together with God and we are stewards of God's earth. And we can manage this earth in a way that it can continue to yield its resources so that our grandkids and our great grandkids can have this earth here to continue to yield its resources. We'll be good stewards of everything that God has given us. One day we'll all have to come before God. We as a group, we as an association, we'll have to come before God. And then we will have to give an account of even this night. We have to give an account of our stewardship. And God has blessed us. By nothing, God has blessed you. If taking a little guy with tears in his eyes 12 years ago, not knowing which way to go, at the crossroad of life, and I've taken you with nothing back to Atlanta, and have set you in the midst of that place. And you've done others like that in this community. You put us there. We're going to have to give us count of our stewardship before God. Sister, one day you're going to give an account of all of those old senior citizens that God entrusted to you. Those people that you were able to feed and to take care of. And you allow God to use you and you to manage those resources that God has given to you. That's the next thing in closing. I, 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 
I'm nervous, I'm getting nervous in terms of of how we raise our money. I went to a group the other day, and I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm leaning close to that group. There, 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 there's a group that I meet when I'm not making a suggestion for this group, for this morning. But there's a group, a staff of people. They don't solicit no money. They've been going for about 35 years. Every Wednesday, all the staff come together. And they pray for the nation of the world. They pray for all the places of the world. And then they wait on God to provide it. And God has been providing those 30 or so years. I'm not making that as a suggestion to us as an association. But I'm saying one thing, that we've got to manage it. We've got to be good stewards. And we've got to be responsible. We've got to be responsible. And I would like to see every one of the groups that's a part of this association become a part of a financial accountability group. And we would help each other. And we can be good stewards of the resources that God put in our hand. And I believe we make that kind of commitment. God, they're His resources. They're God's resources. And if we make that kind of commitment, God will bless us. God will bless us. And we'll make an impact in our community. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you, Lord, we can be here together. Thank you for what we've heard. Lord, thank you for Kathy. Thank you for the way that you worked. You knew her. You knew her when she was in the hills. You knew her when she was gone. You knew her. And you knew what she would do. And so you trust her. You trust him. Thank you for me. Thank you for his life. Thank you for guarding. Thank you for you trusting him to go over the week and then to come here to be a coach in this neighborhood with these boys and girls. Lord, thank you for each person that is here. And that we are all here tonight. And that we all come from this kind of background. From Cincinnati all the places we've come, we're all here and we're all equal. We're all part of your body. And Lord, I thank you for it. And I pray, Lord, that you would do something here as you're doing here. That you would inspire us. That we might leave here as a unit, as a body, committed to work together, to struggle together, to be responsible together, to do your will. We ask this in Jesus' precious name.